Jesus tells his disciples in the Gospel of John chapter 4 and verse 35, Do you not say, four months more than the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Two brothers from a mining family would emerge from a mining town in South Wales, who brought in a harvest of souls and helped establish the British Pentecostal movement in the 20th century. Stephen Jeffries and George Jeffries opened their eyes and saw that the fields were ripe for harvest. George Jeffries came from a very working class family in South Wales, in Nystead. His brothers and his father were all miners. But as a young boy, he was, he was actually quite a good deal frailer than his siblings. So he got a job in, in time working for the co-op as an errand boy, uh, rather than going down the mines. He became a Christian in the 1904 revival. Um, the church he was attending, the minister had been very affected by the, the preaching of the revival and was uh, clearly leading his own church in a way that was spiritually expectant and was uh, believing that God would want to do this work of revival in a very local church. And uh, George Jeffries, as a young boy, was listening to this preacher uh, preaching and gave his life to the Lord in November 1904, the same day as his brother, much older brother, Stephen Jeffries. And these two brothers in time would become key British Pentecostal leaders. But it began in a very poor background, in a very ordinary church, with a minister who dared to believe that what he'd seen happening through the revivalists and the work of people like Evan Roberts could actually happen in his own local church. Now, when you go back and see Stephen Jeffries before he was born again, you see him down in those mines. Those Welsh mines were a rough place. If you ever see a picture of him, he's a stocky build. He had a tremendous humour. You know, his brother George was quite a mild, calmer, quieter guy. But Stephen Jeffries wasn't like that. He, he was quite a bold, humorous. He was the centre of every gathering. But as an unsaved man, he worked down in those mines. It was a rough, violent and a wild place. But you know, again, he had his meeting with God in that 1904 revival. Continuing to be a miner for the next uh, eight or nine years, Stephen began to, to preach in chapels and holiness halls and little evangelistic missions up and down the Welsh Valleys. He would stand on a street corner. He would actually take a seat out and stand in his community. People would gather out their homes. Time after time he would preach until it would grow dark while he preached in a street corner. Men and women out of those mines would stand weeping and crying their way to Christ. This is where God trained him. George, in later days, would, would talk about being a 15-year-old and preaching in the open air, the minister being beside him and coaching him and mentoring him. So from that young age, he's growing in both his calling and his, his, his sense of wanting to be able to proclaim the, the good news of Jesus in a public setting. George Jeffries and Stephen Jeffries had both become Christians on the same day uh, in 1904. And both um, from those days were, were absolutely convinced that this uh, talk of tongue speaking and the experience of the Spirit were not uh, appropriate or relevant or even accurate. You know, they weren't truthful. Um, but what seems to have happened is that Stephen's son went away on a, a kind of a, um, a special Bible weekend uh, in, in South Wales, away from home. And during that time, he came across a bunch of uh, early Pentecostals who prayed for him and he spoke in tongues. Now the story goes that, that Edward was only a, a young boy, sort of 10, 12 years old, that sort of age. He wasn't at all old, but when he came back, he talked to his father and to his uncle, George, about what had happened. And they began to be impressed by what they saw and persuaded by what they heard. And they, in turn, were filled with the Spirit. That led to both uh, George and Stephen identifying themselves with Pentecostals who were around the region and their experiences continued to grow and develop. But it's actually through the work of that young child, Edward, uh, the son, um, that they actually came into the experience of the baptism of the Spirit. George Jeffries wanted to preach, wanted to serve God, had a great desire even to go to the mission field. He went to a Bible school in the north of England in Preston that was run by Thomas Marskoff. 
He sat under the man of God, heard the word, George Jeffries. In there, he met key leaders that he was going to work with for the next 30 years. Now, only two months into his training, a revival broke out um, down here in Wales through his brother's ministry that was so astounding that he had to leave Bible school and come back here to Wales. Stephen Jeffries felt the call of God to step out, to go forth into other communities and towns. A call come to him to go preach in a small town community near the city of Swansea. He come to that first church and he began to preach. In that short mission of two weeks, he's seen over 150 souls born again. The Spirit of God began to fall. I'm tired, there was a wave of revival. Do you know the local newspapers began to call him a second Evan Roberts? They said, this must be another wave of the Welsh revival. Many sat in that meeting and said, this is the beginning of another Welsh revival. So great was that ministry. That's when George Jeffries got called out of Bible college to come and help him. He was preaching day and night, laboring, and he began to pray for the sick in those meetings for the first time. He'd heard that Christ was a healer, but him and George went to a home that prayed for a lady who was miraculously healed. She come and played the piano in all those meetings and testified in the in, in the evening meetings. And this was the beginning of him beginning to see that Christ is not only a savior, but he's a healer. News spread widely. A.A. Body up in Sunderland heard about it, come all the way down to Wales. He said, I must speak to these brothers. I must speak to them. Stephen and George sat with A.A. Body at that time and they began to share their burden. The key burden they had was that in the Pentecostal revival, the great need was for Pentecostal evangelists. And then 1912, 1913, George was invited up to Sunderland to, to preach at, um, uh, during the convention weeks. And from that, that gave him a platform for a much wider audience than he might have had in South Wales alone. And um, in those meetings were people from Ireland who heard George speak and invited him across to Ireland to talk to them about evangelism. Uh, the first meetings uh, seem to have happened in around 1914. Now George Jeffries, he went to a small place called Monaghan, just over the border. He met with some believers. They were meant to hold a campaign but once it was heard that they were Pentecostals, tongue speakers, miracle workers, well, those Methodists who owned that building shut the door. He was praying, seeking God, saying, oh God, what should I do? Many doors were opening up across Britain, but as he tarried and sought the will of God, God said, Ireland. And in an upper room in Monaghan, the Elam movement was birthed. And the motto that they birthed in that upper room was Ireland for Christ. That they would have a band of young evangelists who would go out across the land, pioneering, evangelizing, starting new churches. In Northern Ireland, it was phenomenal. Even during those war years, they, it was greatly restricted, yet they raised up churches in Lurgan, Portadown, Belfast, Ballymena, all the main centers. And again, a revival came to those communities. My great-grandmother was caught up in that. She used to get George Jeffrey's magazines, hide them under her seat. She was a Presbyterian. But she knew there was a reality in this Pentecostal revival. That was the beginning of the work there in Ireland. Stephen experienced far more signs and wonders, probably than any of the Pentecostal leaders. It's just that they were often in obscure places or they weren't written up so well or they weren't preserved for posterity. One of the key events that happened around him, which is kind of a fascinating and... Um, strange phenomena was when he was preaching in a church in South Wales called Island Place, Clinethley. And as he's preaching, um, people get a vision of a lamb on the wall behind him. And as they're looking at this vision of a lamb, it transforms into the face of Jesus. Now, the people at the time say that that image on the wall lasted for six hours. Certainly it was reported in the newspapers of the day, and Stephen would explain it as being the picture of a suffering servant. The vision happened one month before the outbreak of the First World War. And in the light of everything that happened in that horrendous conflict, Stephen believed that what the vision referred to was the suffering that Jesus was engaged with. 
there weren't, this didn't happen again and again by any means. But it's an interesting example of one phenomena that surrounded his ministry and the way he interpreted it in terms of the bigger global issues that were going on around his own time. Stephen Jeffries was dynamic. He would preach like one of those old prophets. He would preach and deal with sin and many would get saved and God would confirm with miracles and signs and wonders following. One testimony of a little girl was standing in the line going into one of his meetings. She did not have eyeballs in her head. She just had empty sockets. There was a traditional local minister standing in the line with her. He looked at her and he actually asked himself, I wonder why she's going to the meeting. What is she going to get prayer for? Never thought that a little girl like that would go in and get prayer to be able to see. You know, at the end of that meeting, an altar call was called and she went up on that altar. That minister, that denominational minister sat on the platform and was looking at her as Stephen Jeffries laid his hands upon her. When he finished praying for her, she had two brand new eyes. She could see, she could look around her. Now this minister was shocked and astounded with that. He would go into hard places, but he would see one miracle. And from there, people would come from all across that city. You know, out of that small beginning in Northern Ireland, George Jeffries planted the first church in Belfast on Hunter Street. And this grew beyond all bounds of imagination. By the end of the war, calls were coming from all across Britain to come plant churches. This whole group of young evangelists to bring this fire, this soul winning fire, and to raise up real New Testament churches. That was the real cry. That burden cry from across Britain, Scotland, England, and Wales got so strong that he moved his headquarters um, in the 20s over into London. He started a Bible school there, made that his headquarters and began to move out across Britain. Over the next decade, it grew beyond all bounds of imagination. He started an annual convention um, there in London. Great crowds would gather in, many souls would be saved. And at the end of that convention, they'd have the Lord's Supper. Do you know there's conventions recorded of in Glasgow and Scotland? Um, in the various cities of Birmingham and London and England, even here in Wales and Northern Ireland, where 10,000 people would gather in these places. Many of these people were saved through his ministry and the fruit of the preachers that he'd sent out across the nation. He would often go into an area, begin with 60 people in a meeting, and end up packing the biggest halls. George Jeffries was the most successful, the most prolific in the in, in that sense, the greatest British evangelist of the 20th century and is almost completely unknown. At the height of his evangelistic ministry, which was probably between the, the years 20, 1924 and 1934, so, but particularly if we, we think of one of those years in 1930, he did a, a, a series of meetings every night uh, over a six-week period in Birmingham. And it concluded, those meetings concluded with him preaching to 10,000 people every night. And over that period, about 30 churches were birthed. The meetings that he held were often huge meetings. He filled the Albert Hall every Easter Monday, time and time again. He was on the front pages of national newspapers. And, and, and these reporters would syndicate their stories, and so they would go around the world. And um, George was very aware of how, um, in a sense, that if you start with the cities and you start with the big towns, then you might actually be able to uh, affect a whole nation. The centrality of George Jeffrey's message was uh, made up of what he would call the four square gospel and um, use that imagery of the sort of the four foundation stones around which anyone's life would be built and certainly churches would be. And the four square gospel was that Jesus was the saviour who came to bring new creation to people. He was the baptizer in water, but also in, in the particularly what he was talking about was the baptism in the Holy Spirit. This empowering for mission and for living well. He was the healer of, of one's body and uh, much of his ministry was engaged with the work of healing. And he was the coming king. So whenever he was preaching, he would 
want to direct people to a saving faith in Jesus, but also a faith in Jesus that Jesus would still work the miracles of his day. And he took real care about how he was engaged in this ministry. Um, many people were attracted by this ministry for obvious reasons. It was pre-National Health Service days. Unless you could afford to pay for medical health, things would be fairly grim. And so it attracted poorer people, it attracted desperate people, but every meeting that he was involved with would close with him offering prayer for the sick. One of the things he would do, though, is that when people were healed, he would have a team of people who would um, take the address of someone and often would take photographs of people. And um, over the years, uh, George Jeffries published a number of books and pamphlets, but, but books as well, where, in effect, he had before and after pictures along with the, address, the name and address of the person. And I think one of the things that he was trying to do at that time was engage himself in authentic spiritual ministry. In other words, anybody could go and contact that person and say, is it true? These were specific miracles that were easily able to be validated or not. And I think I admire that in him, that he wasn't merely saying, you know, 500 people were healed of cancer, but he was telling the name of someone who was healed of cancer, taking pictures of them so that their testimony would continue in the local communities. But it would also give a validation to the gospel message. And so the, 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 uh, the, the meetings and the crusades that he was involved with would be long-term affairs. So the, the meetings were large, they were well-known, they were well-publicized, and healing played a significant part in terms of waving the flag for the validation of the gospel. Stephen Jeffries had a very early impact on the Elam movement within Britain. He actually pastored their first Elam church ever in Wales. After Northern Ireland and the Elam movement being there, the first Elam church was in a place called Dowlas, just above Merthyr Tydfil in Wales. Now he went there, he left his first church and he went there to do campaigns and then was called as their pastor. I've actually seen pictures of him in that church with his elders and with crutches, everything hanging on the walls, all manners of, of things to aid the sick, but people who had been healed and they left all their instruments of illness in that building. I've seen those pictures, you see it all over the walls. See, it was a real New Testament ministry of an evangelist. He went there to Dallas and he raised up the first Elam church. It was the first in the British Isles. From there, he worked with the Elam movement. His brother asked him to join him, um, to join with him. Often they worked together in campaigns. They had preached side by side, labored together to break in on towns and communities. But not too long into the 20s, he left Elam and he actually went as the main evangelist for the Assemblies of God in the British Isles. I, I would actually say he, he was the great influence in establishing the Assemblies of God churches across the British Isles. It was a, a small work, it was an initial beginning work. There was various ministries, but he was the evangelist who went into hard areas, pioneered, seen souls saved, and left those churches for other men to pastor. He, he was the evangelist above maybe any of those ministries, dynamic like a whirlwind. The meetings we know most about with Stephen were in the 20s and 30s. There are one or two books that were written about him during that time, and they point to the miracles that were just kind of, if I say commonplace, it's not that they weren't valued, but it was just sort of expected as part of his ongoing ministry. And of course, in the same way as the other leaders, once people had been healed, and that attracted bigger crowds, and so particularly in places like London and East Barking, that sort of place, he was an out-and-out -out evangelist. His Welshness was very pronounced. People talked about how he would sometimes go off into um, what some people would call, speaking in tongues, other people would call a Welsh hoyle, this idea of just this outburst of exuberant praise or to God. Um, and so kind of never fitted into the, uh, the mold of an organized revival campaign. Uh, was much more freewheeling than that was much more uh, emotional than that in many ways. 
In comparison to his brother George, George was very measured. George was not wild. He wasn't extreme. He was, you know, if you, there are recordings of George. And actually, if you listen to him, people say, he sounds a bit boring, didn't he? Whereas Stephen was much more expressive, much more, um, uh, yeah, sort of full of uh, the passion than perhaps George was. And where he went and where he ministered, he often ministered very powerfully. Because of his um, passion, because of his, for want of a better word, his Welshness, coming from this very south uh, Wales Valley culture, when he came out of that environment, I think people were a little in awe of him. And there had been the miracles around him, the sense that the, the raw, untamed power of God. And this wasn't packaged neatly. You certainly couldn't tame Stephen. Nobody could. And he was his own man and would continue to be so throughout his life. One of the things about George Jeffries which is um, really interesting is that he actually probably never knew any situation except one of revival. He was born, uh, spiritually born again in revival. He lived through the Welsh revival. He, his early experience of church post the Welsh revival was in small groups, what they call the children of the revival, home groups, that sort of thing. And then quickly went into a, a revival um, ministry where wherever he went he only saw growth and revival happening around him. The brilliant thing about this was that he was absolutely convinced that this is how God wanted to use him. The difficult thing about that was he found it very difficult to understand how what it was like for other people, perhaps ordinary church leaders who were embedded in a church for seven, eight years, who didn't live in continual revival. And I think in one sense, it explains why some of the tensions happened between George Jeffries and the rest of his church leaders, because his life really was quite different. He was also single all his life, and therefore was able to be quite focused and single-minded. I think the other thing about George Jeffries is that he was in many ways uh, similar to many early Pentecostals. He was a maverick. He could be... Um, absolutely brilliantly used by God and then sometimes remarkably irrational and knee-jerk reacting to situations around him. I think at times it was quite difficult to work with um, because he was high octane energy and yet when he was in relationship with people who could provide the administrative support around him and provide the consolidation, God sought to use him so well. Probably George Jeffrey's greatest contribution to the Pentecostal movement was to remind Pentecostal believers that evangelism was at the heart of the baptism in the Spirit. That it wasn't just so that people would have this kind of exotic spiritual experience, but actually it, the Spirit is the Spirit of mission, and it's the Spirit who uh, compels us to love our neighbour so that we might proclaim the good news of Jesus to them. I think in his ministry and the way he set his churches up, he placed that absolutely at the centre of their self-understanding. And you still see the traces of the DNA that actually Pentecostalism is linked to mission. And I think for uh, Elim and for the wider British Pentecostal movement, that's one of the gifts that George Jeff Jeffries gave us and uh, enabled us to live with. George Jeffries was a dynamic evangelist. They called him the principal because of raising up a Bible college. It was an apostolic ministry. He didn't see just souls saved. He gathered those lives together like John Wesley. That John Wesley was his great example. He gathered those flocks together after a campaign, leave New Testament churches with new leaders. It was a dynamic revival ministry. He brought revival to communities. He was able to break in upon cities and even upon these nations. Today we still see the fruit of Pentecostal churches in all of these lands. I can't hardly go to a town where there isn't the fruit of George Jeffrey's ministry. In Wales, 
in Scotland, in England, in Northern Ireland, every town I go to almost has something of the fruit of George Jeffries. That, that is phenomenal. When you think all these years later that still the churches are there, people preaching the gospel, people who remember that ministry, it still has remained the whole movement that still exists to this day.